All right, so we're gonna be seeing why um, apparently eating meat is bad for you because of the mTOR pathway. So let's see. What are your thoughts on this current movement at the moment, which is people avoiding and sometimes demonizing meat consumption because of activating the mTOR pathway? Yeah, I think there's a bit of a confusion between chronic activation of the mTOR pathway and acute activation. So we do need mTOR to be active sometimes, right? I mean, mTOR is the most important amino acid sensor we have in our body. And if we want to be in... First, I'm going to say the reason why the uh, mTOR th uh, argument is flawed has to do with the fact that everything pretty much activates mTOR. It's not just meat. It's, um, it's literally the amino acid uh, leucine. So, yeah, plants also have that as well. So plants can also activate mTOR. Uh, carbohydrate intake affects mTOR. Uh, insulin affects mTOR. So there's a lot of things that affect mTOR. And just saying that it's meat already, like, pretty, um, it's obviously flawed. But let's see, if he, let's see what he has to say. I'm not too sure if he knows this or if he's going to add anything else that I missed. A, uh, in an anabolic state at some times, which we do, it's going to have to be activated, right? And yeah, okay, once again, anabolic state. What's an anabolic state? Anabolic state is when insulin's elevated. If glucagon is elevated, this does not, um, this really doesn't happen. So, yeah. In fact, I would argue that the three most important amino acids, leucine, lysine, methionine, will mTOR is the leucine sensor, right? I mean, leucine and mTOR were sort of made for each other. Um, this is very different from the metabolically ill person whose mTOR level is probably chronically elevated. There's also an issue with tissue specificity. And again, part of the challenge here is in humans, we have no way of measuring this. So we can measure this stuff in mice. You can sort of look at mTOR activation in muscle versus liver versus some other tissue. Um, in humans, we can't do any of this. We don't have uh, what, what David Sabatini uh, refers to as an mTOR integrator, a signal integrator. So the sort of the way that hemoglobin A1C is an integrating function of average glucose, right? It integrates glucose level over the previous three months, roughly. We don't have a tool like that to measure mTOR activity. So um, again, I think that the the belief that we need to limit amino acids to limit mTOR activity is is, a, is a, kind of a backwards way to think about it. What that's really going to do is create a situation of sarcopenia, which What's is a uh, muscle, like loss of muscle as we age. Exactly. You become emaciated, which is what vegans, this is exactly the problem that vegans have. So like this is, thank you. Well done. Well done, dude. Well done. Okay. Yeah. Surely though, if people are consuming three to four servings of 25 to 50 grams of protein per day, is that not just going to continue to just spike mTOR? Does that not end up netting out at mTOR just being elevated throughout the day? Once again, remember, remember what he said before. Uh, he, he said it at least. It's leucine. It's leucine specifically. It's a specific amino acid. So just because you have 25 grams of protein doesn't mean you're actually getting 25 grams of protein. 25 grams of protein isn't even because it's all based on amino acid content. Not necessarily. I mean, you have to remember the the um, the duration that you know free amino acids stay in your circulation is pretty low. Um, you're also probably still spending 12 to at least 14 hours a day when you're not eating, right? Mm. So even so, 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 so I'm someone. Yeah. Also, same here. Actually, I do that. Well, I mean, I'm, I, I eat only one meal a day. I don't really eat multiple meals throughout the day. Um, so yeah. And who probably takes a lot of effort to consume, you know, 1.8 to two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And that's going to be spread out over three to four meals, but there's probably still 14 hours a day when I'm not eating anything. And during that period of time, those amino acid levels are going to be really low. I heard about you doing some very extreme fasts over the last few years. Talk to me about those. Yeah, I don't do that anymore, but I used to do a lot of fasting for many years. I would, you know, do a seven to 10 day fast quarterly and a three day fast monthly. Oh, whoa. I did sort of the same thing. Uh, maybe I did it a little bit more, but yeah, I did a, I did a pretty similar thing actually. I would fast, but that, this was actually my journey to figuring out carnivore in the first place or figuring out that meat is 
probably the best option and you don't really need to be adding anything else. And it literally has to do with the fact that, hey, you, um, you're basically getting the exact same benefits from fasting when eating meat. I did, I did it for like my record, uh, highest amount of time for fasting was like nine days. That's intense. That seems intense yeah. to me. You know, I'm someone that's done intermittent fasting. I sat down with David Sinclair four and a half years ago, I think, in his office at Harvard. Uh, and, you know, when David first came onto the scene, which was the first time I'd really, really heard intermittent fasting as uh, being pushed as a, a longevity lever, uh, I thought, well, this is great. Like, you know, it's something that I can do. It's for the lazy among us. It actually makes eating food easier because we've managed to um, reword skipping breakfast as doing intermittent fasting. <laughs> But I found it incredibly difficult to blend staying fit, staying muscular, and doing intermittent fasting. I really, really struggled to make that work. Um, what have you, first off, why have you changed your approach to intermittent fasting? I know that you've gained a, a ton of muscle recently. Um, and how have you worked in blending your understanding of intermittent fasting and its positive benefits with the fact that you want to look good, feel good, perform well? Yeah. So I, again, I still think going back to kind of what are the three ways that you can reduce caloric intake? You can, you can calorie restrict directly. So just track and reduce globally. You can dietary restrict, which is pick certain elements within the diet, carbs, fat, whatever, restrict. Um, or you can time restrict, create a smaller and smaller window in which to eat. Once again... Oh, man, people don't know that this doesn't matter. It doesn't, like, a calorie, I mean, I can understand what he's going for, but calories don't really matter. Like, in today's day and age, you have an abundance of food. Food is abundant. You, you don't need to be calorie restricting. There's too much food available. That's the problem today. It's not that there isn't enough food. It's that there's too much of it. So, calorie, like, calories aren't a problem, and that's not what you should be looking for. It's whether or not you're elevating or basically is insulin going up or is glucagon going up when you're eating whatever you're eating understand the hormone signals and then just just understanding the basic hormone signals you'll be able to figure out pretty quickly whether or not you're going to be in an anabolic or a catabolic state which is um sometimes good sometimes bad so yeah um the biggest drawback of that final strategy which again is a viable strategy but the biggest drawback of it, in my opinion, is the, the reduction in protein intake. So uh, this has been borne out in the literature. So we've seen, we've seen clinical trials that have documented this, that first and foremost, the time-restricted feeding within that 24-hour period doesn't seem to produce any benefits above the caloric restriction that it brings. That's a very important caveat. Okay. It's just Meaning there is nothing magical about the time restriction beyond the calories that are being restricted. Wow. Okay. So the hunger signal that people get, which is those of us that have taken like the, the Sinclair red pill. Um, Once again, that hunger signal comes from carbohydrates. You don't have that hunger signal or well, I don't anyways. Um, I don't have that hunger signal on carnivore. Like it pretty much doesn't exist. It's minimal and the way you can train that hunger, hunger signal or get it get rid of it basically is just do intermittent fasting first because that's that's what actually determines ghrelin because ghrelin will like spike every 24 hours and ghrelin is the hunger hormone which is the whole point of why you feel hunger in the first place it's ghrelin right so it spikes and it does that like three days uh in a row after a certain period of whenever you ate and that's kind of a big deal because let's say you're eating throughout the day constantly eating throughout the day that means ghrelin is always going to be elevated throughout the day so you're going to be feeling hunger hunger signals the next entire rest of the day especially if your leptin is screwed up as well which leptin gets screwed up from insulin so and you don't end up feeling satiated yeah once again this is like um that's that's a wow i didn't actually talk about this in my science behind carnivore that i'm aware of well it's not really a science behind carnivore this is more like intermittent fasting stuff and just understanding some hormones but it's really interesting. Um, th this is a signal that I'm hungry. This is hormesis happening. This is discomfort. This is good for me. Has no different impact than small amounts of satiation throughout the day with... There's nothing that has been measured or documented in any clinical trial that suggests that that is beneficial over the caloric restriction. In other words, if you're going to eat 2,000 calories spread out over 12 hours, 
or you're going to eat 2000 calories spread out over six hours where you're, you know, calorie, you know, your time restricted feeding for 18 hours. We're not seeing any difference. Wow. Yeah. Once again, it has nothing to do with calories. That's not the point. I mean, it's just, it's eat till satiation pretty much. That's the whole point. And if your leptin is screwed up because you add carbohydrate in, then you're going to have to eat throughout the day because you're not going to probably, um, well, first off, your ghrelin's going to get hit as well. Your ghrelin's going to get affected. So, yeah, not ideal in my opinion. Once again, uh, I started I started this whole carnivore journey by learning about intermittent fasting and then doing it, and then afterwards doing intermittent, not just intermittent fasting, but afterwards doing like twenty four hour fasts, then forty eight, and seventy two hours, and then I jumped from seventy two to like ten day fast or nine day fast, which is pretty extreme or considered extreme, but Honestly, it felt pretty good. I, I will admit it felt pretty good. So if you're going on a sort of journey in terms of uh, working your way towards trying to be healthier, I would I would say um, that could be one thing you implement is the intermittent fasting part because I think that's a very, very big part. It's a very, very, very big part about being healthy. Now, and now that's not, uh, here's what's interesting. That's often not what happens. So what more likely happens is the person who calorie restricts um, has an easier time, believe it or not, maintaining muscle mass than the person who time restricts. Why? Probably for two reasons, uh, although this hasn't been fully teased out in the, in the data. I'm going to say right now, the reason probably has to do with the fact that insulin most likely is being elevated con consistently. And, I mean, uh, glucagon goes down and that puts you in anabolism, which means storage state. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's what I think anyways. I don't know if he's going to talk about it, but. Because they're not tracking it this closely. But my, my impression is that when you time restrict, you're just less likely to eat as much protein. And secondly, as you kind of alluded to earlier, um, it's a delicate balance to get the right amount of amino acids into the muscles. You can uh, okay, good. He, know he knows that. He knows that. That's very important. Yeah, once again. Just because you're getting 10 grams of protein doesn't actually mean you're absorbing 10 grams. You could get, get one, you can even get 0.1 grams or 0 0.0001 grams out of 10 grams of protein because that's not how proteins work works in the body. It's all based on the amino acid content and how balanced is that amino acid profile. If it's not balanced, you're not absorbing any of it. If, if you have zero of one amino acid, you get zero protein. So pretty much can't have too much and you can't have too little. So what you don't want to do is waste, for lack of a better word, your amino acids down a gluconeogenic pathway where they're basically being used as glucose substrate. What, what, okay. What would cause that to happen? Either too much or too little. So and what's you, too much and what's too little? Yeah, sort of 10 to 20 grams of protein, the liver is going to preferentially take that and use it as glucose. And Yeah, but basically what he's saying is, um, which is in my uh, amino acid video. Well, that, that video isn't out yet. But um, basically what he's saying is amino acids, the all the ones that are wasted, uh, usually because they're like, you have too much of one, right? All of those end up getting converted into glucose. I'm very much against glucose. <laughs> I don't like glucose at all. Uh, the lower your glucose, the better. Because... Glucose is literally the thing that causes aging. It is the primary factor because it is the one thing that causes glucose oxidation is not optimal. Never, ever, ever. Only for your erythrocytes. Otherwise, you want fatty acid oxidation. You want ketones. You want anything but glucose because glucose produces more NADH and more NADH once again goes to complex one, which is more prone to um, electron leakage. A, a complex one is more prone to electron leakage. So, yeah anything over about 50 grams, the liver is going to say, I'm going to take that excess and also make it glucose. So it, let's just say your number is 180 grams of protein per day, eating 18 servings of 10 grams a day, not going to achieve optimal results. Uh, having one serving of 180 also not going I've, to- I've tried both. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that person really probably ought to be doing four servings of 45. Right. So once again, this has to do with amino acid content. Like it's really specific and it's very difficult because um, honestly, 
I gotta be honest, I know like the basics of amino acids, but when it comes to like the specifics of how much of each concentration and understanding like, is it like five grams of, um, well, that's way too many, way too much tryptophan for instance, but basically like how much of each uh, essential amino acid is there and how is it used in the body? Because I'm pretty sure every single um, amino acid is used differently in the body for different quantities. So it's, it's really, really complicated. Like it's insanely, insanely complicated. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that one for that matter, because that, that is very, very difficult. That is insanely difficult. But understanding the basics of how it works will give you a pretty good understanding of like, oh, okay, this is why when you eat plants, you get no protein whatsoever. It has to do with the amino acid profile. But understanding how that's used in the body, like how the body uh, prefers one or the other based on whatever it's building, that's like, that's insanely complicated. Way too complicated. So you're saying for most people, it seems like roughly a sweet spot is 25 to 50 grams per serving. Exactly. Right. So in this regard... And that, that time-restricted feeding guy has a really hard time doing that if he's mm, going to be deliberate how, about that. How big is the gap? When does a feeding yeah, window a great, stop? That's a great question. Probably about three or four hours. So it's basically impossible. For Often, the time-restricted feeding person, yes. unless they're willing to eat protein outside of their window. Right, okay. Which, if you are uh, dogmatic around... If you're dogmatic, it becomes very difficult. Correct. But if, you're, if you understand that... There, and what we do with our patients who, in, who want to do time-restricted feeding, because I think it's the easiest one to do. Yep. Like you just, I would agree. It's the easiest one conceptually to do. It's the easiest one to be compliant with. So what we would say is, look, it's just about the calories. So I still want you to have a low calorie protein shake in the morning mm -hmm. where you're going to have 200 calories of, of a protein shake. That's basically just protein, some, you know, cashew milk and a few frozen berries. Ah, man. That's really bad. Cashew milk and frozen berries. Oh, dude. That's like glucose oxidation, that's fructose, that's glycation, that's lipid peroxidation because of polyunsaturated fat content being more susceptible to reactive oxygen species due to having a pi bond and the delocalization of electrons. That is um, the cashew milk. I don't know if cashews have cyanide in them. Uh, I know that they're pretty high in polyunsaturated fat content though. Yeah, once again, this stuff is not, that stuff is not healthy. That is definitely not healthy. Not normal. Not good. Not good for your body. All right, so I hope you learned something uh, about the mTOR pathway as well as a little bit about amino acids and maybe even some uh, something about hormones because uh, I actually don't cover that in my Science Behind Carnivore playlist. That's just like a little bit of basic endocrinology. But yeah, it's, it's still pretty interesting. Um, I find that interesting anyways. <laughs> if you want me to review anybody else uh, specifically, please let me know in the comments below. And... Uh, if you really do like the video, please like, share, subscribe, do all that. And if you want to see all my videos ahead of time, click the join button down below where that's exactly what you can do. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.